The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hello, my name is Professor Andrew Kadak. I am a professor of the practice here at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department. What you're about to see is a summary of a course that we are presenting here at MIT on operational reactor safety. This course was prepared with a funding grant from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the hopes that this material could be used by other universities in teaching more advanced nuclear power engineering. What we're going to try to cover in this course are the fundamentals and basically a review of the fundamentals of, of reactor physics, core design, uh, heat transfer, thermal hydraulics, power conversion systems, safety and what the implications are in the design for safety, as well as probabilistic risk assessments. One of the key parts of this course, once you've established the fundamentals, will be a visit to a simulator, both the Pilgrim simulator, which is a boiling water reactor, and the Seabrook simulator, where you'll be able to test your knowledge and learning to see how reactors actually perform. We also will also look at some of the more common accidents that nuclear power plants have experienced, including Three Mile Island and the Chernobyl accident, and we'll address some key current regulatory questions that are hot topics for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the industry. We hope that you'll be able to use this material in classrooms or self-study programs, and uh, we look forward to presenting this to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, welcome to the new course on operational reactor safety. This course was developed uh, with the support of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the hopes that it could be used for other classes and other universities to help you better appreciate what nuclear power plants are really like and how they're regulated and operated. What I'm going to do this morning is uh, go over what we have as an overall agenda and course objectives. We're going to try to focus on understanding the complete nuclear reactor system, which basically means the core, the balance of plant, all the support systems that are required for nuclear, and the interdependencies of, of, of all the systems in terms of how they affect the safety of the plant. We'll also touch a little bit on the regulatory oversight and how that functions if you're running a good plant versus what you're running is a bad plant. The topics that we will specifically cover are listed below. Now, this course is intended for people who have already had fundamentals of reactor physics, heat transfer, thermal hydraulics, and can understand uh, many, of the, many of the important aspects of the technology. And what this course is intended to do is bring all those together in the in power plant to be able to appreciate how they're all related to performance of the system. Now specifically, we're going to be doing reviews pretty fast, lecture by lecture, of certain fundamentals to make sure that we're all on the same page. The topics we'll be covering are reactor physics, a review of reactor physics, we're going to be reviewing how we make power using the power conversion systems. We'll look at the basic safety systems and functions that are required in a nuclear power plant to keep it safe. We'll introduce the concept of risk assessment in terms of not only in terms of design but also in operations. And I think the highlight of the course will be simulator exercise. We've arranged for you as a class to go to the Seabrook Nuclear Power Station, which is a pressurized water reactor and to the Pilgrim nuclear power station, which is a boiling water reactor. Happily, they're within about an hour's drive of, of, of MIT. And in those exercises, and we'll be going to them after we get some of these fundamentals under our belts, to actually test your knowledge and to gain an appreciation of what goes on in the control. We'll also talk about technical specifications, which, as you may know, are the so, sort of the rules of the road in terms of nuclear power plant operation. They, they describe specifically what you're allowed and not allowed to do and what you're committed to doing in terms of uh, tests and inspections during the operation. And lastly, I'm going to talk about a very important system, uh, system, what I call a system, and that's the safety culture of the plant, which in fact determines whether you run a safe plant or an unsafe plant. 
clearly there are many reactors that are all built of the same type and the same technology, but some are run better than others. And safety culture is a clear difference. This is a slide that summarizes the uh, overall course objectives. And this is by lecture by lecture as, as topical areas. Uh, today we're going to review the overall reactor types that are presently in existence. To, uh, the next lecture we'll be talking about reactor physics, and then a review of reactor kinetics and control. We'll then study feedback effects and depletion. Then we're going to go to the MIT research reactor to do a reactor physics exercise. We'll be doing some changes of control rod position to assess feedbacks, uh, reactor period, and you'll get a chance to actually maneuver the reactor, which is just down the street. Then we'll talk about how we remove heat or energy from the reactor in terms of uh, being able to convert the fission process into useful energy. Then we'll discuss specifically two types of power conversion systems. One is the steam cycle, which we call the ranking, and the other is the brake cycle, which is the gas cycle. Uh, then we'll address safety systems and functions, what kinds of safety systems are incorporated in these plants, and what their basic functions are. We will then look at the safety analysis reports that are typically prepared for reactors, and we'll review certain types of accident and transients. We'll have several lectures on the safety of the plant using the safety analysis report as a basis. We'll then touch on the probabilistic safety assessment as a tool. We're not going to make you PRA experts, but we will help you appreciate this tool that is available to us, and not only in design and also operations. Now, this lecture, which is 13, which is the integration of safety analysis into operational requirements. What I will try to do in this particular lecture is take all the safety analysis, all of our fundamental understandings of the core and how we remove heat, and we're going to translate that into what turns out to be operational requirements, which are specified in our technical specifications, which, as I said, allow you to do certain things to the reactor that allows it to stay within the design basis. Which then leads us to two interesting questions. What is the licensing basis of the nuclear power station versus the design basis? The licensing basis is different than the design basis. We then will go to uh, Seabrook and then Pilgrim, and we'll do various accident scenarios in their plant simulators, which are, as you know, a replica of the control room of each of those plants. And we'll do loss of coolant accidents, we'll do possibly steam line breaks and other types of transients for both a B and a PWR. These exercises will hopefully give you a good appreciation of how operators really respond to accidents as opposed to simple textbook assessments. Then we're going to look at some significant accidents. Ours being the Three Mile Island accident, we'll talk about what were the causes and what were the uh, consequences and what the industry has done to change, and also the Chernobyl accidents. These are the two dominant, publicly recognizable uh, events that have really caused nuclear power to be somewhat questioned in terms of the public eye. We'll also study the davis Bessey event, uh, the most recent being the, the reactor vessel head degradation which occurred in 2002, quite many, many years later, after the Chernobyl TMI events. We'll then discuss safety culture, then we'll talk about what, we, what I've listed there as new safety challenges. Basically, this is what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has on their hot list of issues that one needs to be able to uh, resolve as reactors are continuing to be operated. These include terrorism, what are we going to do with spent fuel, the uh, pump sump question, but those those will be very interesting because they're kind of current everyday issues that the NRC is struggling with. And then we'll conclude with a summary discussion of what the industry has developed in terms of advanced reactor designs for the near term and the longer term. So hopefully this will be an interesting course for you. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground. A lot of it's going to go pretty fast, but I think once you're done with this course, you will be well versed operational reactor safety. Now the way this course is going to work is uh, obviously you have to get grades and the grade structure is homework will be 50, 15% of the grade and I'm scheduling uh, three quizzes but there might only be two and then the final exam. If we only have two quizzes we'll just apportion the 60% amongst the two 
between the, the two quizzes. And of course, late Homer will receive half of the full credit. Uh, so now, with that as an introduction to the overview of the course, I'd like to now spend some time going over what we have in terms of present technology nuclear reactors. And the object objective here is to gain a broader understanding of what we have relative to pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors, and high temperature gas reactors, which are now coming back in terms of interest because of the next generation nuclear plant being a high temperature helium cooled gas reactor. Now, to appreciate nuclear, you have to understand the nuclear fuel cycle and where reactors fit into this mix. And going over the nuclear fuel cycle, we have uh, several steps. Now, this, this slide comes from the NEEF textbook, which will be the textbook for the course. And you'll see homework assignments based on the NEEF textbook. And at the end of each lecture, you'll see some homework assignments posted on, on the web. Now, typically, we're going to be focused on the reactor. But there's so many other important steps that we need to understand. And it's broken up into what we classify the front end, which is the steps taken from mining of the ore, exploring and mining of the ore, to ultimately making the fuel that goes into the reactor. We also have this back end, which after the spent fuel is, is used up in the reactor, it is stored, possibly reprocessed, which we used to do, and recycled back into the reactor. As you know, the French do this, the Russians do this, and the Japanese are now doing this. Uh, we, from the reprocessing plant comes the high level waste that will be disposed. As many of you know, the current strategy in the United States is a once through fuel cycle in which the fuel goes right from the reactor to storage and then as spent fuel assemblies to be disposed. The, cur the current policy is being reconsidered now where we might in fact go into this complete nuclear closed fuel cycle, they call it. In the mining, milling, and enrichment, enrichment as you know is an important step for light water reactors. We have to take the 0.7% uranium 35 ore and enrich it to approximately 4 to 5 percent for uh, fuel to be used in thermal light water reactors. Uh, so this is sort of a big picture view of, of the nuclear fuel cycle. Now to, to give you some graphics about what each one of these steps are, this is the mining obviously. Some of these mines are deep mines. Many of them are, are, are not necessarily strip mines but open mines where the uranium ore is mined, it is then milled, and ultimately then enriched as a gas. It is converted into fuel pellets. The pellets go into fuel pins, where the fuel pins are assembled into fuel assemblies, which is right here. And then the fuel assemblies are placed into the reactor, and the core is operated for, for about a year to 18 months before it has to be refueled and fresh fuel has to be put in. Typically in these reactors, about one third of the fuel is taken out, replaced with fresh, and the fuel is rearranged for neutronics purposes so they can run for another 18 to 24 months. Now this is a picture of, of, of some reactors. These are called generation two. Two reactors uh, were built in probably the 70s and 80s. And uh, you'll note there, there, the Diablo Canyon is in California, Minnesota, New York, South Carolina, Virginia. And you'll note here that these are mostly pressurized water reactors. And you also note that what's missing in these photographs are the typical cooling towers, which are, have been used as a symbol for nuclear power. I deliberately chose not to include those because I wanted you to to show you that nuclear plants have containments and reactor or power conversion systems, which are typically steam turbines. These are twin plants. Most of these plants are twin plants. Indian Point has three reactors on the site, and Surrey has two. And these are the locations if nuclear power starts, we start building more nuclear power plants, that they'll be building additional plants at existing sites, at least in, in the interim. Now, one of the key objectives, obviously, is to make electricity for nuclear power. All the safety stuff, all this understanding how these plants work is very important, but the objective is to make electricity. And in order to do that, we have to make heat, we 
We've got to remove the heat using some kind of fluid, whether it's be water or gas. And we've got to pass this fluid through a turbine. That turbine turning a generator, making electricity. That's the whole goal of using nuclear power. We do it because we don't release any CO2, noxious gases in the environment, dust, particulates. It's essentially a clean energy source which people are now recognizing as a really important value. Now, in terms of the removal of heat, we've got to not only take that fluid, which possibly you can see here a liquid metal, didn't mention this, but breeders are another form of reactor that can be used to make electricity. But we want to take this and we want to pump this through the core, capture the heat of, of, of the fissioning, and then take it into a system that is circulating that coolant, and whether it's transferred directly to turbines as boiling steam, as you know, steam from a, like a BWR, or to steam generators in a PWR, pressurized water reactor. Now, we then have to condense this steam and recirculate it back either to a steam generator or back to the core. Now, the next slide gives you a, a a, a simple version of a boiling water reactor, a schematic. Now, if you look at the reactor core, you see that we're going to be allowing boiling to take place in the core. We're going to have certain types of systems like steam dryers and separators that will make the steam drier, in other words, eliminate the water that's remaining in the steam since there is boiling. And we're going to send that directly to the turbine, which is outside the containment structure. Now, this React this part of the uh, nuclear plant essentially replaces a fossil boiler. Namely, instead of boiling water by burning gas on tubes, pressure tubes, housing this water, we're using this reactor to boil the water and send steam directly to the turbine. You'll notice the turbine is connected to the generator, which, which the turbine spins, making electricity for the uh, consumer. Now, once it comes out of the turbine, it's, it's a mixture of steam and water, which has to be condensed in what we call a condenser. It's basically a whole series of tubes that takes water from the environment now, whether it's a river, lake, or ocean, and condenses the steam, makes it back into water, and is re-pumped back into the core. Now, this is the simplest type of nuclear power plant and exactly replicates what is done in a fossil plant. So if you look at this part of the curve, this chart, everything to the right is in fact what you might see in a conventional fossil oil or natural gas plant. Now pressurized water reactors are a little different. And we have, and I'll get to that in a moment, but there are many reactor types that we can talk about. I've just done the boiling water reactor, the pressurized water reactor, which we'll get to. But we also have a heavy uh, natural uranium heavy water cooler reactors, which are developed in Canada. We have the Russian RBMK reactors, which are boiling water reactors, but they have, instead of water as a moderator, they use graphite. We have fast reactors, which, which use a liquid metal uh, in the form of sodium, or perhaps lead. And then we have gas cooler reactors, which could use supercritical carbon dioxide or helium. And then the last category, which have been developed in the past, but not recently, is organic cooled or molten salt reactors. So all of these are choices that the engineers and the utilities can make in terms of what they want to use in terms of making electricity. Now the two types that are common in the United States are the pressurized water and the boiling water. And we used to have helium cooled gas reactors, but they were shut down pretty much in the uh, 70s. Now, when you um, want to make some heat, what we want to do is use the fissioning of uranium atoms or plutonium, which is a fissile material, uh, to release approximately 200 million electron volt, uh, volts of energy per fission. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we also need to enrich this material from 0.7% found in nature to 3 to 4%, maybe up to 5%. Gas reactors require enrichments of oil in the order of up to 20%. So we need to fabricate the uranium into pellets, which are clad in zirconium tubes, which are placed into the reactor core. Now, the process of uh, fission is relatively simple, and most of you, I'm sure, are quite well aware of it. 
where you take a neutron, hit, hit it a, at a certain proper energy, uranium-235 atom, and you create several fission fragments and hopefully at least two and a half or so neutrons that can be used to create uh, more fissions. And, and the release of these ex excess neutrons allows one to maintain what we call a critical reactor, which is self-sustaining in the sense that it can continue to fission neutrons, fission uranium-235 with time. Now the energy that we're trying to capture is kinetic energy of these fission products. The neutron energies are relatively small contribution to the energy that we can capture from the fission products. So this, as these things release energy and our, and our may release energy which we're trying to capture as heat. Now again, one fission releases 200 million of electron volts. Now if you want to calculate how much, if you fission one gram of uranium-235, you can, when you convert it to electricity, make 24,000 kilowatt hours of electricity, which is a lot. And one gram can essentially light a small city overnight. Now to do that same amount, of, make that same amount of power, you need 3.2 tons of coal and roughly uh, 13 barrels of oil, which is obviously something we want to avoid doing. And the energy density of uranium-235, in terms of energy divided by mass, is about 28,000 times the energy density of coal. This is an important metric because we can, using uranium-235, and in fact a small amount, produce the equivalent of 28,000 times the amount of energy produced from that same mass of coal. And that's why nuclear is so, uh, so desirable. Now you saw some of these slides where pellets go into pins, which are then made into assemblies. Now, when you look at this, you see these people handling the uranium pellets. Now, uranium in this form is very low in activity because it's uranium-235 has a very, very long uh, half-life. So the activity of this uranium-235 is, is extremely low, which can be handled. Obviously, when you put this back into the reactor, it's another story because then you have all the radioactive fission products produced. So when you create this reactor core, what you want to do is take the fuel assemblies and configure them into the core in such a way as to allow the number of neutrons created to be sufficient to continue the fissioning process, which is a critical reactor. Most, and what reactor physicists do is figure out how to arrange the, the, the fuel in this reactor such that it maintains criticality for, the, for 18 to 24 months. So in order to do this, you have to understand what's in the reactor. Physically. So you need to model the uranium fuel, the reactor internals, which are typically metal. They absorb neutrons. You have to figure out how the flow will affect the, the, the uh, reaction rates, because remember, water becomes a moderator for us, and that moderator allows the thermalization, namely the slowing down of neutrons, to be able to fission in a thermal reactor. We then have to then use reactor physics tools and develop what we would basically calculate to be the flux distribution. That flux is a flux of neutrons that then will be able to create fissions that will then yield what we call power distribution. And as you might imagine, their power distribution is not uh, flat, but is, is sort of like cosine shaped in the core because we have neutrons that can leak out of the reactor and also neutrons that will be captured in the middle. But this power distribution creates what we would call the heat source that we then have to remove from the reactor. Now to give you a sense of what's in this reactor vessel, the, the water comes in, goes down the sides of the reactor and up through the core, and as it's heated up, now this is for a PWR, it will then go to a steam generator. Above the core, you'll see control rods. Control rods are used in a PWR typically to change power level uh, and also to shut down the reactor. Now these control rods are on top of the reactor vessel head and upon uh, 
a signal that the reactor should be automatically shut down. They drop into the core by gravity and essentially shut down the reaction. Now this is a picture of a reactor uh, being refueled. You can see the, now this is under about 40 feet of water, and you can see the fuel elements uh, being placed into the reactor or being removed from the reactor. It's hard to tell from this picture. And you can see the blue glow to the trend to trend off radiation that uh, fresh fuel assemblies coming out of the reactor uh, would emit in the water. Now, one of the things I think that we need to appreciate in terms of uh, factors in the design are how and what considerations we have to incorporate in the design of this reactor to be able to uh, assure safety. Can you pause it for a moment? Okay, now these factors are, uh, are part of, of, of what an analyst would have to go through and think about in terms of is the design that he's constructed a safe design? Now, obviously, the first thing is the core design. And in the core design, you have to really understand the type of fuel that you want to use. It's uranium-235. You have to be able to, as I said earlier, model the physics of the core and to be able to understand the core power distribution because it's so important to have a flatter core power distribution such that your limits are typically based on the peak, the highest power distribution in the core, which if you can lower the peaks to make a flat power distribution, you are actually enhancing the efficiency of this reactor neutronically. Then you have to figure out, once you design the basic power distribution, you have to make sure you have what is called reactivity control. And reactivity control affects the rate of the nuclear reaction. And be able to assure that you can shut down the plant under all circumstances. And the other important part of the reactor core design is the safety analysis. The objective is having no fuel failures, or if there are fuel failures, they're limited, and two, you don't have a melting situation. And the requirements and the regulatory requirements are such that you have to make sure and demonstrate under a wide variety of circumstances and transients, including a complete loss of coolant accident, that the plant has emergency systems that are capable of keeping the core in a condition that is a coolable, B, the releases are limited and minor, if any. And that's why they set certain temperature limits on what you can do relative to, uh, for example, the peak clad temperature, which we'll talk about in the class. The other part is how you want to remove the heat from the core, which obviously is related to the safety analysis. Now, in, in this area, the most important thing is understanding the heat transfer from the fuel assemblies to the core, whatever that core is. And clearly, uh, many different types of fuel assemblies, as, as you will see, a BWR and a PWR fuel assemblies are different, and all the heats that are generated in that one fuel pin need to be removed. And obviously, in the safety systems, you have to decide what kind of emergency core cooling systems you need to put into the plant to be able to keep the plant within the condition of no fuel failure, and uh, such that you do not have to challenge the containment, which is the next one. The confinement of radioactivity. If you have an accident that releases radioactivity into the coolant, which is, is permitted, uh, you need to be sure that that radioactivity is not released. And the confinement of radio radioactivity, the function that's performed is the containment. And of course, we can never forget, all of this is done to produce electricity. Now this is a graphic of a typical reactor. Now, I'm gonna go over some of the fundamental systems just to, for you to gain an appreciation of what we're talking about and how interrelated the systems are and, and how important understanding that interrelationship is in the overall reactor and plant design. We've already talked about the core, the fuel, the reactor vessel, the control rods. This core sits in the middle of the containment. Now you'll see a lot of stuff around them. You'll see steam generators, which are listed here. This is the vessel again. 
this is a steam generator, this is a PW one, that makes steam, that takes steam, and they send it to the turbine generating unit. This is called over here what we call a balance of plant, or the secondary side of the plant. The, the primary side, which is the reactor, to the steam generator, which are in the containment. Now you'll see a lot of other systems around the plant. Now these other systems are what we call support systems. They are aimed at either cleaning the water in the primary system, providing separate shutdown cooling functions, water chemistry, charging and volume control to make up water. Uh, so the plant is much more complicated than simply the reactor and the steam and the, and the, and the power conversion system. There's a lot of things that you need in this plant that you need to completely appreciate to be able to say, well, I'm running or I'm assigning the safe nuclear power station. Now, this is a schematic of that particular plant. And again, what I, what I hope you'll be able to do after this course is over is be able to look at this diagram. I know it's like an eye chart, but look at this diagram and understand how the reactor linked to the steam generator, is linked to the pressurizer, is linked to the main coolant pumps, and all of the other support systems that may affect the safety of this particular plant. These are basically inter in, in, interdependent systems that one needs to appreciate such that if there's a failure, say in this area, what impact might that have on the, be the ability to remove heat from the reactor? safe condition. So this eye chart you will be familiar with when you finish this course because you'll be able to understand A, where the water goes, B, if you lose it, what happens to temperature, and what happens to the containment in the event of certain types of accidents. Now everything is controlled in, in a nuclear power plant under control. Now I've just shown you a relatively modern advanced boiling water reactor control where you can see operators the, the, the shift supervisor, control room operators, and a more modern control board that is used to control all the systems that we talked about in this previous slide. Now this is the heart of the, of the plant. This is where everything is, is monitored and actions taken to shut down systems, turn on systems, and they're all done remotely from this location. And these operators, and the training of these operators, and their part, in my view, of key safety system for this reef, for nuclear power plants. And when we get to the simulators, you'll see an older version of this, uh, both at Seabrook and Pilgrim. Remember Seabrook was started construction in the, in the 70s, as, and, and Pilgrim came online, I believe, in the, in also in 1972. So you'll see generational issues compared to these more modern nuclear power plants. Now let me go over boiling water reactors and then we'll do pressurized water reactors. Schematically, here we have, you've already saw, seen a simple diagram. You've seen the core, and what we have is a direct cycle, which is steam coming from the reactor, going to a high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine, going to the condenser, then they have reheaters and feed water heaters, then that water is condensed ultimately and sent back into the reactor as feed water, and that's how the heat removed. BWRs have recirculation pumps, which take a stream of water from the reactor and pump it through a jet pump to aid in the core flow through the reactor. But bottom line, this chart at this point in time, what we'd like you to focus in is it's a direct cycle where the Water is allowed to boil in the core, steam is dried and separated, and then sent to the turbine, and the system is relatively straightforward. For a BWR, this is a more detailed view of the reactor core, pointing out several other functions. The feed water from the condenser coming down the vessel and up through the core. These jet pumps recirculating water and essentially provide an augmented velocity stream that will send the water to the core. They have steam separators and dryers, and then at the end of this, the water will come back, and the steam will be fairly dry, and go to the turbine. We'll look at some analysis as we get later on in the course. 
that shows how these things work. And the mass balance is an heat flux. Now, BWR fuel assembly is unique in the sense that because we have boiling going on in the core, the, there, is, there needs to be some assurance that every fuel assembly is getting coolant and getting water. So the way the boiling water reactor design has been made in terms of the fuel, the fuel pins, which are shown here, which contain the uranium pellets with a spring to hold the pellets in place or down, and what we call a gas plenum. This gas plenum is used to uh, capture the fission products, which are gaseous, such that the fuel pin does not overpressurize. Now this fuel pin is placed in this array of, of bundles called fuel assembly, and the bundles are put in what we call a fuel can. Now this fuel can has, has, is designed such that the water coming through there has no chance of going into another fuel assembly which allows one to be sure, assured that water coming in, which is water, and the water as it's boiling here will stay in this regime. This is a very important design difference between a BWR and a PWR. So BWR fuel assemblies are essentially can to make sure that we have an adequate supply of cooling water. We also have different types of control rods. If you look at the fuel assembly, these are four fuel assemblies. What they have are cruciform control blades, which are put in the core in between the fuel assemblies. And they have various water rods and tie rods that are meant to assist in the control of reactivity and power distribution for this fuel assembly. Now, these cruciform rods in a BWR are placed in the core during operation. BWRs do not have uh, boron in the water, such as a PWR. The boron is used to control the reactivity of the core. Reactivity meaning the extent to which the core will go critical. Instead, the BWR fuel assemblies have burnable poisons, which are specific poisons put into the fuel, poisons in the sense of neutron absorbers, that will be depleted over time or consumed, allowing the reactor to maintain certain levels of criticality. Now, these burnable poisons are designed to deal with what we call the excess reactivity, which is we're putting in more uranium than we need to allow the reactor to run for 18 to 24 months. And that excess reactivity needs to be balanced by these burnable poisons. In addition, we put in control blades during operation to control the power distribution in a BWR. Now, this is a relatively bad picture of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station on Cape, on, on, on Cape Cod Bay, where you can see the inlet, and this is now the discharge, and this is the reactor, and this is the power conversion system. These pictures are hard to come by these days because of 9-11. Now, pressurized water reactors, excuse me, are, are, are different. And this is a schematic of a PW1. Now, what we notice are the differences are that the water in the reactor vessel is not allowed to boil. Pressure in a BWR is about 1,000 pounds, which allows the boiling to take place in the core. In a PWR, the pressure of the water is about 2,000 pounds, which prevents boiling in the core. Now, the water, again, from the main coolant pump is circulated into the core, goes down along the downcomer and up through the up through the core is heated and not allowed to boil. In, in the PWR, we also have what is called a pressurizer. This is sort of a pressure regulating device that maintains the pressure in the system at about 2,200 pounds. If the pressure is too low, they have heaters here that are used to increase the pressure. If the pressure gets too high, they have sprays that will condense the bubble in the pressurizer. So this water then goes into what we call the steam generator. Now this is a U-tube steam generator where the tube, where the primary system goes into the tubes and it transfers its heat like a radiator to a second. Okay, the steam generator basically takes water from the core, which is again at 2,200 pounds, and sends it through, through tubes and transfers the heat from the tube 
to the other side of the tube, which, which has the water that is used to make the steam. So imagine a tube over which water is flowing, which is the blue water, and that water is allowed to boil in the steam generator and then create steam, which is then also dried and then sent to the turbine and then ultimately to the condenser, which is then repumped back into the steam generator. You'll also note in, the, in this figure, we have the condenser taking water for, from a river, a lake, or an ocean that would, or a cooling tower for that matter, that would condense the steam. Recall again, if you were to draw this line to the right here, this is the secondary part of the plant, which every plant, whether it be fossil or nuclear, has that uses steam. What you see also here is a containment wall line. The steam generators are inside the container. And you'll also know in a PWR, we have three different cooling systems. The primary, the secondary, and the third system, which is the system that actually goes into the environment. So we have one, two barriers as compared to a single barrier for a PWR system. Uh, again, we can all, not, not, not ever forget the generator making the electricity. So reviewing again, primary system, no boiling, goes into a steam generator, which is thousands and thousands of tubes through which the primary water passes, giving its heat up to the secondary water system that's allowed to boil, and then steam is made which is the condenser. Now in a PWR, we have essentially boron to control reactivity. Obviously, we need to increase the enrichment of the such that it can run for, say, 18 months to two years. Now that enrichment, that extra enrichment, that reactivity margin is balanced by the inclusion of boron, which is a neutron absorber, into the coolant. So the, as the reactor is consuming the uranium, the boron concentration is reduced. And these reactors are typically run unrotted, namely no control rods in the core. So again, if you look at the schematic, we have the containment, we have the reactor core, cooling pumps, going to the steam generator, the steam generator pumping steam to the turbine, making the electricity, condensing it. Now here we see the steam generator, I'm sorry, cooling tower. Then you have various feed water heaters, and that will send the water back to the back to the steam generator. And the primary cooling pumps are in the circulating this water. So the line is the primary side and the secondary side. Now typically a, a PWR, and this is a typically con a configuration for four loop PW, PWR, we have uh, about 200 fuel assemblies arranged in, in a, a roughly cylindrical pattern. We have what is called a thermal shield, and that thermal shield is meant to protect the reactor vessel from fast neutrons to keep the embrittlement of the vessel down. And the arrangement of the fuel in this, in this uh, reactor is the responsibility of the reactor physicist. Typically, you'll put fresh fuel on the outside because that's the most reactive, oldest fuel in the middle to keep the power peaks down, and recycled fuel in sort of the, the middle ring to levelize the power distribution. Now these are some parameters for a, roughly a thousand megawatt electric plant. You're talking anywhere between 32 to 3400 megawatts. The amount of heat generated in the fuel is about 97%. So there's some gamma heating. The nominal system pressure is 2250 PSI. The flow rate is 138 million pounds per hour, which is a lot of water. The inlet temperature is typically 550 or so degrees. The outlet from the vessel, this is Fahrenheit now, the outlet from the vessel is 620 roughly, and the temperature rise average over the core is only 60 degrees. Um, the diameter of the core is 11 feet, and the core height is about 12 feet, those are typical standard fuel assemblies, and there's about 86,000 pounds or kilograms of uranium in the core, and this again, there's about 193 fuel assemblies in this particular example. 
So the the design of these PWRs is, is uh, in terms of outputs for the steam side, is about similar to that for the uh, PWRs. But the reactor core parameters are really quite different. So if you look at a PWR assembly, what you'll see is an open grid with the same fuel pins, types of fuel pins, and you'll also see that you'll have control, this is a picture of a control rod going right into the fuel assembly not in between fuel assemblies. And these control rods, again, falling by gravity, and the control rods are used only really to shut down the reactor or to make gross power level changes. And if you look at a typical grid, you can see here typical control, control rod locations that are needed for, for shutdown or power level control. Now this is a picture of a uh, PWR wire two reactors, one big steam turbine hall, and cooling towers for heat removal. This is in Chicago. Each reactor is about 1,100 uh, megawatts, and these two came in service in 80, 85, and 87. Most of the nuclear fleet came in service in, in the late 70s and early 80s. The next reactor I'd like to talk about is a gas-cooled reactor. This is an example of a Fort St. Brain plant which is a high temperature gas reactor that operated uh, up until, I guess, uh, late 80s, uh, perhaps early 90s, I just don't recall at this point. But it made 330 megawatts of power. Unfortunately, its operating record was very poor, and they converted the plant to a gas turbine plant. Now, the gas turbine, gas reactors use what is called a Brayton cycle, which is a gas cycle. And it's probably one of the more simple cycles that we have, where helium gas is, is blown into the core, and the gas coming out of the core, in this case, I think it was around 750 degrees centigrade, which is much hotter than the light water reactor, goes to a high pressure turbine, low pressure turbines, and to the power turbine, which is then made turning uh, a generator. So it's a gas turbine reactor. Core, the core gas goes to exactly a gas power turbine, which is then needs to be compressed after it's expanded in the turbine and sent back into the reactor after it's properly uh, cooled as a gas so it can be pumped efficiently. So it's a simple cycle where the gas from, and this is helium gas now, is circulated through the reactor and goes right to the uh, gas turbines. Now it's a gas turbine, not a steam turbine. And helium is the coolant, and um, it is because they go to high temperatures, they go to much higher efficiencies, 40 to 50% range. And this is the technology people are looking at for the future. Now, the fuel is also dramatically different than you might see in a light water reactor. It's a ceramic fuel made of tiny microspheres called trisocoated fuel particles that where the uranium is in either a car, uranium oxide or carbide surrounded by a porous buffer layer to capture the fission products. And then a pyrocarbon layer, pyrolytic carbon layer, which is hard, surrounded by silicon carbide and another pyrolytic carbon. And these are the little tiny fuel particles that go into and are pressed into, in, in the general atomic space, a prismatic uh, reactor, which is a fuel compact which are then inserted into graphite blocks. Now these graphite blocks are in fact the fuel assemblies. About 10 of these are stacked high in the core and there's, uh, I don't know, I don't recall exactly how many, but these become the fuel assemblies which you can refuel in three dimensions, which is another interesting challenge. Another type of uh, high temperature gas reactor is what we call a pebble bed reactor. And this, this technology has been also used in the past. Uh, originally, I think, invented in the United States, but developed in Germany at the Ulich Research Institute, where they had op an operated pebble bed reactor now for over 22 years. What a pebble bed reactor is, is in fact the same coated particle uh, with the uranium kernel. And they're about 
10,000 of these particles that are put into a, a graphite pebble. And this graphite pebble is about the size of a billiard ball. And 10,000 coated particles in a graphite pebble that is literally dropped into the center of this reactor and is allowed to drain out slowly as the reactor operates and then is recirculated and put back into the top of the reactor. Now, the pellet bed reactor has the same basic safety features as a high temperature uh, prismatic reactor in the sense that it has a meltdown free core. The power density is about a factor of 10 lower than in the light water reactor. And, and the fact that graphite is there is a very high heat capacity medium that can absorb a lot of heat. And this technology is, uh, as I said, has been used and is now being developed in China. And they have an operating couple bed reactor now, a small research reactor, and it's being proposed in South Africa. And this is one of the two candidates for the next generation nuclear plant that hopefully will be built in Idaho by 2021. The, uh, the technology, again, this is an online refueling system which basically avoids the need to shut down the reactor and refuel. The pebbles are continuously recirculated. The temperatures are quite high. Again, it could go from 850 to 900 degrees centigrade. The thermal power, however, is small. It's only 200, 250 thermal megawatts. The South African design is, is upwards of, of 400. And the power output, electrical power output, looking at 40 to 45 percent thermal efficiencies, ranges from 120 to 160 megawatts electric. And that's one of the disadvantages. These reactors are not designed to be big, uh, but are suitable for very high, highly efficient electric production. The vessel, the core height is, could be 10 meters, 8 to 10 meters. The core diameter is about 3.5 meters. And you'll see in this picture, there's a center column of graphite pebbles. This being the fuel zone and this being the unfuel zone. And this is done because the control rods are not in the pebble bed. The control rods are in fact placed outside of the core. What you also see in this design is that there is graphite, a lot of graphite, which is the graphite reflector for this core. So inside the graphite, the pebbles are, are literally dropped in place and discharged through the bottom and then recycled. The way these pebble bed reactors work is the helium comes in, up the side, and down through the pebble bed. It's not a fluidized bed. And the hot helium comes out here that goes either to a direct cycle, a direct grain cycle, or an indirect cycle, which can be also used to make steam. So a 60 millimeter diameter pebble, uh, pebbles in about a one uh, millimeter uh, microsphere diameter. The coolant is, in fact, helium. Now, this chart, which is one, one of the final charts, provides a summary of the major reactor types. And I want to focus in on the boiling water reactor and the pressurized water reactor. You can look at the high temperature gas reactor, but now this is more or less dated information because we're going to a different technology than what has been proposed here. But in terms of the different types of reactors, the fuel form is the same, uh, uranium dioxide. The enrichment is the same. The fertile material, meaning the non-fissionable, is uranium-235. And we're also putting the fuel pins in the same zircaloid cladding tubes. Now what you'll note is, in a boiling water reactor, the typical design is an eight by eight, which means eight fuel pins, eight by eight fuel pins, in a typical assembly recalling that it's now in a can. In a PWR, we're talking about a 16 by 16, 17 by 17 arrays of fuel pins. And you'll notice the number of fuel assemblies in a BWR is off around 750 compared to around 200 to 240 fuel assemblies in a PWR. So the design differences are really driven by the mechanism of heat removal in the reactors and how that reactor is operated. 
if you want to just take a quick look at a breeder, or at least a breeder reactor, we have either mixed oxide or plutonium oxide. Uh, there's a blanket region in which you can make plutonium using uranium-238. And the fuel pins are very, very, very tiny in the sense of uh, the diameters. So this is sort of gives you an overview summary of, of the reactor types that we're, we're going to be talking about, the safety systems that will be uh, discussed, and hopefully, as I said at the end of the uh, of this of these of this course, you'll gain a much better appreciation of how all this stuff fits together. This is the reading reading and homework assignments from NEAT, chapters one and chapter two. And uh, we'd like you to read just chapter four to get familiar with, uh, with the material in that for the next lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, now's a good time to ask them, but I hope most of this material has been of a review nature and it sets the framework for our future discussion. Recall, our next lecture will be on reactor physics. Now, in that one lecture, we are going to try to cover everything you need to know that you took a whole semester on in an hour and a half. So it's going to be fast. If you're uncomfortable with the material, let's try to get some help to bring you up to speed because we're going to assume that you understand reactor physics and this is basically a refresher.